everybody. Thanks so much for joining us at the uh, this online event to chat about the Decameron 2.0, which was a fabulous project that I was lucky enough to be part of and that uh, we have four members of the creative and um, uh, producing team here with us today. So uh, the first thing that I would like to do is to start by acknowledging that I am coming to you tonight from the beautiful lands of the Ghana people on the Adelaide plant. And on behalf of the Australian Writers Guild, I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge their continuing beautiful relationship with this land that we are all living on. So thank you. And I would also like to introduce our panelists this evening. And I have promised to keep their bios a little, a little short, but you can read them in all their brilliance and see every amazing thing they've done uh, on the registration page, or you can Google them. But we will start with Mitchell Butel, who is the Artistic Director of State Theatre Company South Australia. He holds four Helpman Awards, three Sydney Theatre Awards, and two Green Room Awards for his work as a performer and a director over the last three decades. So in short, Mitchell is an impressive force in Australian entertainment. Edwin Kemp Attrell is a South Australian theatre maker. He's the founder and artistic director of Act Now Theatre and the former artistic director of the University of Adelaide Theatre Guild. And Edwin's work focuses on interactive theatre and participatory storytelling exploring social justice themes. Alexis West has worked as a dancer, choreographer, performer, writer, theatre maker and filmmaker for over the past 20 years. Um, as a Biri Gubba, Waka Waka and Kanak woman, Alexis is passionate about First Nation people's voices, as well as the stories of people with disability and people from diverse backgrounds. And Emily Steele is a multi-award winning writer, originally from Wales, who has lived in Adelaide since 2010. And her work in Australia includes Rabbit with State Theatre Company, presented by Steele and Brown in association with State Theatre and Adelaide Festival Centres in Space, Sepia for Rios, Rocket Town, um, The Clock for Act Now and Rios, Man in a Bag for AC Arts and Polygraph, um, 19 Weeks with uh, her own company, uh, which has won awards left, right and centre. And in the UK, Emily has also written for um, BBC Radio numerous times. So thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Now, it did come, was drawn to my attention today that some people might be watching who uh, might be among the very few people who didn't tune in to watch the Decameron episodes. And for those people, I'm just gonna give a really brief snapshot of what the Decameron was. So it was the brainchild of Emily Steele who took the idea to Mitchell at State and then uh, State Theatre collaborated with ACT Now to create a, uh, a reimagining of the situation that was portrayed in the novel, The Decameron, where uh, 10 writers went away for 10 days and came up with a story each every day while they were quarantining away from the plague. And Emily's idea was that we would have 10 writers each week for 10 weeks as well, but that we would have a theme every week and um, create episodes, uh, released every week for 10 weeks. Uh, and each piece would be a standalone monologue. And so that's what The Decameron 2.0 was. Um, now, a lot of, there were a lot of online theatre projects in 2020, as theatres and live productions were sort of closed down around the world through um, the consequences of the pandemic. But I like to think that the Decameron, our project was uh, pretty special and unique in some ways, um, in, because of the epic scale that it was, the, the sheer quantity of stories and the time span that it framed. Um, because of the collaborative nature between these two iconic South Australian companies who've never previously collaborated and the short turnaround that was required by artists and through the extraordinary diversity of voices that were brought to the, to the fore through this project. So I want to unpack all of those during this conversation, but first let's turn to the scale. Um, so Emily, when you first took this idea to Mitchell at State, I'm just wondering whether you had any kind of, if you'd really thought through at that stage, the, the scale of what you were proposing and, and how many people that it would involve an impact. Um, I thought it was bonkers and I thought we'd never go for it, to be quite honest with you. Um, I, uh, I'd, I'd read parts of the original to Cameron as a student and I'd gone back to it when COVID-19 blew up because I thought, here's a great time to read um, 
stories written after a plague. Um, and I suggested something that was actually smaller in scale. Um, I think it was just, I was like, we could have 10 writers who have lost work because of the pandemic um, and they could write um, a piece, one piece a week over 10 weeks. And actually it was Mitchell who came back and went, I've had this really exciting conversation with Act Now. And we were thinking we could open it up so that actually it could include loads more writers and more diverse writers and more actors. And, um, and it just, it became um, a much more ambitious um, and inclusive project um, because of Mitchell and Edwin's uh, ideas around that. Great, so, so um, Mitchell and Edwin, maybe you could talk to what it was like as the artistic directors and sort of executive producers on both sides. Uh, what was it like to wrangle such a beast? <laughs> um, Edwin, do you want to? Sure, it's funny because um, I think Mitchell and I both had an idea that it would be, there would be a more of a kind of stable 10 or you know five actors each week and then a few people kind of coming in and rotating so it's almost like at each stage of the process when one person talked to another the kind of the scope increased um so I think a lot of the um the scale of it came from particularly in terms of the casting came from um Yasmin um and Anthony who I think is um joining here uh in the way that they wanted to make sure that the casting was reflective specifically of the characters that were written as opposed to having a kind of ensemble model. Um, so uh, I think none of us really understood the scale at first and it kind of, it just kept getting bigger and bigger as more people came on board. Yeah. And it's one of, because I mean, one of Emily's initial ideas, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, because Edward and I have been kind of sniffing around each other for a while anyway to, to do something together, but, uh, and Emily's kind of notion that wouldn't it be great if many people who'd lost gigs as a result of COVID and lost work, that they formed the kind of basis of the group. But then also, the, as Edward and, and, and Emily say, that the notion of trying to include as many people as possible, actors, directors, writers, was super important because so many were all feeling this together. But, but also it felt like there, here was an opportunity to actually because the reality of our company is, you, you know, we, we get to program eight main stage shows a year, which means most of my, a lot of my job is saying no to people, which is the worst part because there's so much great material comes across the desk. And so you think, I love all these different artists and I want them to be involved with the company, but there's only finite resources or slots. But a project like this meant we can, on a smaller level, engage with, with a different company, with different artists on a on a really wide level, and then which creates fibers, hopefully, and we'll talk about this later, no doubt, about fibers that then lead into other works and, and there's access. And so it's been that's been a huge um, joy of the project. But then also for the works that were created by the writers, the five core writers, and then all the the First Nations group, the queer group, and then additional writers to see how great the work was has been so incredibly heartening and um, rewarding. So, so yeah, I mean, if we could do it again, rather than a hundred stories, let's do a thousand next time. <laughs> I know, sorry, I was just wanting to say, um, Go on, yeah, um, just uh, how important those conversations that when you engage Yasmin Garibu and Anthony Nikolai about um, just for their advocacy for representation was really, really important. And that's why that engagement was so powerful and so strong. Um, yeah, and I think that that was the, such a strength with this collaboration. Yeah, and, and it being such a collaborative process. And as you say, Alexis said, like, so Anthony Nicola and, and Yasmin Gruber were the kind of supervising directors of the thing. So Ed and I, we, you know, Ed and I worked on the grant, the kind of grant to RTSA for it. Um, with with Emily and that all happened but once once it all happened and I like yeah it's we've got it but then it was Anthony and Yasmin was like right this is your baby you know yeah. so with Emily as supervising writer <laughs> and I think Edwin was very hands-on as a director of photography as well it was very much they who 
led the writing rooms and, and kind of led the casting process and the attachment of directors to different things. So I would look forward to going, oh, who, who have I got this week? Who, who am I mm. working with? And, and that, that, was, that was I was great. going to talk to you about that, Alexis, actually, the, the fact that, um, you know, most, most of the real, the core creative team were wearing multiple hats and you had, um, and you're actually wearing a hat today. So this is relevant to you. Um, so you, uh, you were um, not Idiot. only one of the <laughs> core writers, but the, so there were five of us who were core writers and there were, how many, was it five core directors as well? Or um, two? Edwin, yeah. Anthony, Yasmin, Edwin, Alexis, Clara, Yasmin, and Sasha Zara did some. You did uh, some. Yes. Kiara Miller. <laughs> Kiara Miller <laughs> as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So there was a, there, you were part of that team of directors, one of the core writers and uh, First Nations consultant as well, which was obviously a really big responsibility. Um, uh -huh. So, uh, can you, and I know that all I had to do was just write one monologue a week. And mm -hmm. because of the 10 weeks in a row thing, at times that felt like a lot, you know? So how did you cope with that sort of scale of, of work and multiple things to be thinking about? Sure. Um, yeah, it was exhausting. Um, that's just the one word. Um, but kind of to go back to uh, when it first began and, um, and um, got, an email from Ed, I think it was Edwin and you, Mitchell, about the the project, and I was like, a, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a bit cranky because I was like, oh, I just wanted to do my own thing, but you know, you get so there's things that you want and there's things that you need, and hmm. this project, oh, my spirit needed this, and yeah, and um, and also my confidence as well that oh, actually I can write, I have to write, I don't have a choice, I've, I've got to deliver this, I've committed now. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it has been exhausting, but I, um, I, I do really love connecting people. It's probably one of my favourite things to do and seeing um, just a spark in people um, and then just kind of hooking them with the, with the other right people and just, you know, making magic happen. And, and so it's, it, it is like that, you know, with a, with a monologue, with a script and then um, thinking about who could deliver that and having conversations. We had mad conversations, it was pretty deadly, um, but yeah, big, long ones. Um, and then kind of thinking outside of the box and just, you know, the work that I've um, had in the past with ACT NOW and doing the pathway programs really absolutely fed into um, the pool of uh, actors and performers and um, writers and directors that I mean it, it is really important to um, for us to remember that it is about not only um, creating those pathways but then actually having opportunities mm -hmm. so that yeah and so I, I felt really blessed um, that I could be a part of just being part of the writers team and and thinking about what I'm writing for and who I'm going to write for being a part of those casting conversations to get the right people and Yazzie and, and Anthony like deadly like such corker jobs um, and then, you know, finding the right director as well. And yeah, and to not only just to honor the stories, but to honor the, um, the performer as well, giving them an opportunity to showcase their work, like how deadly the writer, get, like hopefully the, this will end up becoming a publication. Um, and then the opportunity for future auditionees, like mm -hmm. now we've got material, like a body, oh my God, if only I had this 20 years ago, mm -hmm. like maybe I might've got a, job acting there eh? <laughs> <laughs> bless um yeah um yeah and then the privilege of being able to direct not only um my words um but um directing other people's words and um and then working with amazing actors as well um with these beautiful scripts and uh yeah just trying to honor all of the facets of this creative process which has been beautiful you, you touched on something then, Alexis, which I wanted to talk about next, which was because uh, you said, you know, you were, maybe were unsure of yourself as a writer, but you just had to and it was due tomorrow. So you just had to do it. And that was one of the most thrilling aspects of being part of it was the short turnaround. There's not often most writers will tell you that they have a tendency to procrastinate and stress about things and get anxious about it. And then they tend to do it in the last minute anyway. But in this instance, mm -hmm. The writers were given a theme on a Thursday morning, every Thursday morning at about nine o'clock, 
and then we needed to hand in the monologue by two o'clock the following afternoon. And that's not that amount of time, especially because most people are juggling um, other things in their life, whether it be other projects and work or families or whatever. And we had many conversations amongst the writers about how brilliant it was to have no choice but to just do it and to ignore the voices of doubt. So did you want to, Emily and Alexis, talk a little bit about that? And also then we might get to what that short turnaround was like for you as directors, um, Edwin and Mitchell as well, and as a cinematographer as well. So Emily, yeah. Um, it was kind of thrilling. I mean, there's something, um, when I first started out as a writer in, back in the UK and in Wales, um, this was the sort of stuff that we'd be tasked with. Like you'd have a very short amount of time to turn around a script. And sort of the idea that, that you would, you wouldn't have too much control over um, what then happened to it and you'd hand it over and then someone would direct it and someone would perform it and you'd sort of throw everything at the wall and see what stuck and to me that was such a an exciting invigorating way of approaching work where rather than dwelling on it for months and months and months and developing and developing you just kind of had to go with what your instinct was mm. um and you know I think if you look at all the monologues and I know with my own some of them work better than others and there's there's a sort of there's a liberation in going you know what that's okay what the nature of what we're making is that it is fast and it is dirty and it is rough and ready and that's exciting and if everything's not perfect that's okay um so it was i had a lot of fun with it how did you go with it alexis um yeah, I, um, yeah, y yes, and um, yes, and stress, yes, and stress, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, because um, I need a bomb under me, so that's that was actually the best thing, and then kind of coming from uh, from a creative process of you get together with your dancers, you make up a story, and you've got the music there, and bang, you just and then you've got to perform whatever whenever um same with working with no strings attached and theatre disability that very collaborative and we only meet together like you know on a friday and then bang we've got to make a performance da, 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 whatever it is it is and it will be what it is and um and then just as a poet um when spirit moves within me and then i just am writing and it and it's just normally just like a one edit flow and that it's so that it is actually my process and I do need um especially if, if, if I've got a delivery I need a, a, a deadline mm -hmm. and I generally go past it the queen of extensions <laughs> yeah 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 um well, what was that like um Mitchell and and Edwin like because you had that schedule was pretty jam-packed like I know I spoke to Yasmin a few times and she just didn't have a minute to to breathe because of the the you know get the monologues send it to the director get it cast shoot it and then you were overseeing other editing things and stuff as well so what can you talk a little bit about that Mitch you go oh, um yeah I I mean you know as you you I did the least work of anyone on this zoom <laughs> to be completely honest so um yeah, as I, you, you wonderful people were right at the three, um, Sally, Emily, Alexis, and Ben Brooker, and Alex Rickery Howe, and then other regulars like Kiara Miller and, and um, Karen Weitra. But for me, like in the first two weeks, I read every single monologue I've seen, watched who was directing what and who was acting, and I was like very, you know, try to hang big. But then the following weeks, I loved just finding out, like, oh, what actors are on this week? And oh, and actually not reading some of the pieces till I saw, like I knew the, the two pieces that I'd be directing or, or um, I was very lucky to act in Verity Lawton's piece and Ben Brooker's piece in the final episodes. But uh, so I'd always read those and I'd speak to the writers to go, have I got the right um, vibe of your piece or can I check this word or the kind of inspiration for this particular moment. But I wouldn't kind of engage with the other works until I would watch the episode. Edward had filmed them all, so he he saw them all. But I loved that because it, because even though the provocation was uh, the same for the ten writers for that week, it was a real thrill to me 
to kind of uh, work on those two works, but then see how they fit contextually in the rest of it, but not actually controlling what the context was and going, but bizarrely, the, the, kind of, the kind of connections between the different works seem to work in every episode as well. So there was, it was a real lesson for me in uh, release of control and going, it, as Alexis says, it will be what it will be. But I was so happy with the result. Like I didn't go, oh, what a shame. You know, if only we were like that about it. The, the kind of abandon of the project actually became one of its major virtues, I think. Mm -hmm. Edward? Um, to one of the things to add is I think the the kind of director of photography role was um, in some ways the funnest in that because we didn't have any pre-production meetings we wouldn't read we wouldn't kind of say before the day we wouldn't say okay this is how we're going to shoot this scene it would literally be that the director would come down from rehearsals and we worked out that the most streamlined way of doing it was me and the um, the lighting designer Sue Gray Gardner would have a chat to the director and just ask the two questions of what is it about and what do you want the audience to feel and from that kind of those two questions would go okay great why don't we do it here you know sometimes the director would have an idea and sometimes I'd be like actually this one I'm you know I'm really struggling with and so it was a really interesting kind of process of with such a short time frame it's just a kind of yes and game where you kind of go like oh, cool, why don't we do it then? And then they go, yes, and let's put a light like this. Yes, and let's, you know, like it was that kind of... Um... Or say, no, put it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> One of the great things, I think this was Edwin's idea too, was that because we had limited time, limited actor time, limit, limited kind of tech time, that we would film and we had the way the kind of nature of the actor payment and calls happened, we had to film two actors like one actor would do a monologue from episode one and a monologue from episode two and we would literally just turn here's the camera looking at one space and then we turn the camera to look at the other space so anthony and yasmin chose what spaces at wigan sun our workshop or at act now or ultimately holden street that we use but again that limitation and kind of uh pressure i think was great because you had a even though you know 10 monologues are in the same in this physical space here you know someone's got a lamp here Clara Solly Slade would design hers beautifully like the frame was always really different and gorgeous mine often be someone sitting in a chair but um but there was and Anthony often had like like strong theatrical kind of um impulses as well so that was great to see oh how did this frame here how does everybody deal with that differently so it was and like that double casting and having to do two in a short period of time that I, I watched the filming of just one and I was really struck by the pressure on the actor which they totally you know they they nailed it but they 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 had to get it right within one or two takes um or they don't really or they don't and there's not enough time because mm -hmm. of the the parameters being so solid and strong and so that was you were there, Emily, thrilling as well, because it's like, it is what it is. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Many did use the tele, there was a teleprompter often just off camera, like just yep. here. It, so many people, yeah. you know, occasionally it's the actors, you know, like to be or not to be, that is the question. Where the t-shirts <laughs> were in the way, you know, so. Uh, Which was great to support the actors. Um, for me, I, I wanted to use a teleprompter for every monologue so that then the actor could then um, lean into um, the spirit behind the words um, and the true meaning of that and just, yeah, and to um, shine a, uh, the lens on them, the, the best possible lens. I also want to mention Caitlin Moore because she was the other DOP as well. Yeah, and, you know, what a great crew. What it was awesome, like everyone, deadly. Yeah. One of the good things too, because uh, and Matt Byrne from Kojo initially set us up with, with camera equipment and kind of a kind of basic gorilla um, you know, and Jessica Zeng, our marketing um, person who helped with, with filming and stuff as well. So all of us were learning things and, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been on the other side of the camera, for, for, you know, as an actor, but to actually, you know, clap a loading and doing the stuff and blah, 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 ring lights here and, you know, where's the USB and la, la, la. <laughs> it was super fun. And that's one of the things that I think was so brilliant about how the project turned out is that that out of necessity a lot of people had to learn to do new things and also because 
you know, for many people, they'd never directed film or they hadn't performed for film, that it, but because of the turnaround being so quick, there was a way in which you, everybody flew by the seat of their pants. And so you made decisions quickly and didn't worry about them too much because you couldn't. Um, and it feels like this is one of those things that I think it's an upside that's from the pandemic is that um, theatre people tend to be very adaptable and innovative people and having the opportunity to to try something right. new and discover that you can do different things. Is and, you know, really and, and all the people that were behind the cameras and, and making it, putting, editing it and filming it and, uh, you know, doing all those film jobs they weren't used to did them so incredibly well. I yeah. know when all the writers got together to watch the first episode when it went live and all of us sort of tentatively admitted that it was a thousand times better than we thought it would be because um, <laughs> <laughs> because it, the production values were beautiful and uh, it wasn't, it didn't look like just theatre that got filmed. It looked... It was, it was certainly, it was filmic. And it, I mean, it was a hybrid, obviously. Like, and that, that was one of my favorite things watching it was the way that it sort of sat simultaneously in um, film and theater. And I think that's a credit to all of those people who learned to do things on the spot and, and just did it so well. And I should um, say too, and, and, and Andrew Howard from State edited the first couple of episodes, but then Anthony uh, Nicola took over about halfway through, I think either episode four or episode five. And Anthony had never really edited before. And so, again, that was a massive learning. And he did an incredible job with that. And, yeah. But then I, even kind of things like where to, because with the monologues, you know, where to cut, like, do you let it fade or do you cut hard at mm -hmm. the end? And just, yeah, it was yeah. really, really interesting. Um, so something that I was personally relieved about when we sort of first found out about what the project would be was that we weren't being asked to write specifically about the pandemic. Although this project came about through um, Art South Australia uh, COVID-19 funding um, and the pandemic obviously kind of filtered through in everyone's consciousness and came up in stories uh, quite often, but it wasn't about that. So I just wondered... Um, Maybe uh, Alexis and um, Emily, if you wanted to talk a little bit about how the themes that we were given influenced your work or how you kind of went about um, responding to those themes, but also about how the pandemic influenced the work. I was gonna say, Emily, did you wanna speak first about um, like the, the Decameron and the themes and how um, Anthony and Yasmin were curating that for the sure. 10 weeks? Um, so, Part of this came from the original um, the Cameron in that um, the story goes that there are um, these seven young women and three young men um, who are actually all quite rich and privileged and they, they decide that they're going to get out of um, Florence and go and stay in a lovely villa with their servants, mostly, um, uh, to wait out the Black Death. And while they're there, the stories that they tell are, um, are not about what's happening, not directly about what's happening in their world at that moment. They're more about escapism and sort of, they might be funny or they might be romantic or they might be rude or they might be, so there's all sorts of, um, they, they tell the stories to entertain themselves while they're um, in isolation effectively. Um, just as an aside, I thought one of the really nice things about um, the reinvention of this was that we had all the different voices that were not just a bunch of young uh, rich people. So that's, uh, anyway, as an aside. Um, <laughs> but so the, the themes that we came up with were sort of loosely based on some of the themes from the original, um, but also, um, Anthony and I think Edwin, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, tweaked some of those to um, just partly to uh, make them feel relevant and partly to make them um, all different enough from each other to be interesting. Um, just Anthony, by the way. Oh, just Anthony. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to credit you there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would have taken it, but I think you've <laughs> got I'm going to. Um, but they, uh, the themes, when we kind of looked at them, 
Um, there was and Yasmin too. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I said and and Yasmin too. Sorry. Yeah. And Yasmin and Yasmin. Um, but um, when we looked at them, we tweaked the sort of focus so that it was always those who do something, so that the focus was on character rather than on idea. Um, so it was always designed to be about people so that when people came to write the monologues, they would have, hopefully they would go straight to a character rather than philosophizing. Yes. Um, I'm going to mm. shut up now. Yeah. No, that was good. That was really <laughs> good. Um, yeah, and uh, having a theme every week, uh, you know, and it's it's been such an intense year and this, you know, with the spotlight on so much oh it's just it's been really intense and so having a theme to hook into those who sacrifice being the the first one just yeah then being able to find a character and you know for me my impulse as a writer is to write what I know who I know or there's there's always somewhere of me in there um and just and being able to have a platform to be able to to it was it's been cathartic it's been incredibly cathartic and of and um and i hope real i hope that um i feel that that some of the monologues that, I, that i've written um and you know and the, the pieces that i got to do that had the privilege to direct that it spoke to people's hearts and that there's a shift and a growth an expansion and a change and an opening of the lens, um, yeah, which I feel like has just been uh, really important during these times. And um, uh, from being this woman who was resentful about doing this project to being so grateful, I feel like we've just done an amazing job, but I'm so proud of all of us. And, you know, I really hope that if it just changes one person's heart, the work that we've done together, I think also, Alexis, your, the work that you're doing um, uh, and also is, is similar to um, Kiara and Kyra on the other First Nations writers, there was um, a lot of very personal things, but also a lot of kind of historical and it was so engaged in um, meaning and life and, and a whole range of different things, as well as being very diverse in style. Particularly, I think mm. your writing was quite different week to week that there was such different styles but it had so much more um uh emotional weight to it and uh yeah it, there was something kind of very special about the stuff that you were creating where it had that kind of historic significance in it I think thank you Edwin thank you I I think we this came up um, we're in one of the writers' meetings sort of about midway through and, and actually when I, I just chatted to Alexis today and we were, we were talking about this conversation that, you know, for those of us on the core writing team who weren't coming, representing a community of any kind and just were there just as a writer, our pressure was just to create a good story. That's it. You know, we just, we respond to the theme, we try and create a character that will speak to people as well and that will entertain them, but we don't carry with us a weight of responsibility to provide a platform or to uh, to shine a light on an issue or to, to share our pain or to you know and uh that's for that i was just so conscious and i think a lot of people were of the beautiful way that you all did that that you um that you carried that responsibility as well as still rising to the challenge of just doing a good job you know and and um it's lovely to hear you talk about it and i can see how much that moved you but that's a credit to all of you who made the project happen that that you know everyone was able to do that um and actually that that sort of moves us on i guess to the the um the issue of diversity which was such a big part of what uh the decameron ended up being um sorry i just want to say i like this word that um eleanor carapetes uses representation it's just that's a good one yeah it's, sorry, sorry. Instead of diversity yeah. Representation. Representation. Okay. Uh -huh. I yeah. 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 Good, good point. I, I like it. Um, yeah. Brings us to the point nicely of representation. And uh, I, I wondered 
um, to speak to all of you about that. Obviously, Alexis, I'd love to hear more on your thoughts as, as the, the um, that weight of responsibility, what that was like. And also, Edwin, because um, there was a lot of the writers and actors uh, were coming from communities that are part of the network of Act Now Theatre, and you as a company, um, right from the outset, have been about um, highlighting and promoting marginalised voices. I just wondered if you could speak about how this fit in with your bigger picture as well, and, and what other people and other companies can learn from that. Yeah, I think um, uh, the diversity that we had in the project came, I think, from two things. One is the fact that we, we, we've been engaging, particularly with the communities of queer First Nations and culturally diverse for a number of years. So that's our kind of bread and butter programming. And so we were kind of, uh, we were fairly well primed to be able to um, uh, incorporate them into this project and also extend our networks as well. But then the second thing was making sure that um, uh, that uh, diverse people were part of the core team in the first place. So, you know, having Alexis as one of the core writers, having Yasmin as one of the um, supervising directors, um, doing that was, I th those two things in combination, I think was essential that it was, um, it wasn't just a kind of, obviously it wasn't tokenistic, but it also wasn't a short term thing. We didn't go, okay, for this project, we're going to, engage with um you know uh, a broad range of of people it's actually what we do year on year and that's quite necessary to be able to have those relationships so that you can go oh yeah this this person will be right for this moment or um yeah so i think that was what contributed to that and and mitchell how has that um, and I mean, I know that that's something that State Theatre Company has also been um, continually moving towards doing more of as well. And it's evident in your programming since you've been there, which is wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about that collaborative nature there and how that kind of might inform things in the future for you guys as well? Yeah, look, I, I just think we're, I was, we, I slash we, were really lucky to kind of hook in to, you, you know, when, when I kind of arrived, I, you know, Found out about Alexis, and I was like, I need to find this woman and bring her to us. And and also uh, with Edwin's work as well, you, you know, and, and because it's been such a huge part of Act Now's kind of kind of mission and brief to to actually to kind of utilize because it, and you know because I you know I've even though I worked for this this company five times in the past and worked in Adelaide many times. I'm from Sydney. I've been here a year and a half now. But I don't. I'm unaware of some pockets of of, of artists because just because I haven't lived here. But so it was like kind of you know, avataring into into Edwin's and and Yasmin's uh, database, kind of hooking and going. Oh, all these fabulous people are, are coming at me, which is um, so that's incredibly lucky. And from that, and as you say, like it was really crucial when I applied for the job that I really wanted to. Uh, you know, more broadly diversify the kind of creative teams and the kind of acting pools of the shows that we do. And, uh, but now having witnessed some of the great work from artists involved in this, many of whom are now in the 2021 season and will be, you know, trying to create networks into other works for a lot of those people as well. That's really, really exciting. But it's it speaks to, I think, Act Now's, um, incredible hard work and dedication to not only finding the best kind of voices but also empowering people who are at the beginning of those kind of artistic careers to go no no what is your voice Do, you know and can we help shape that voice in a larger fashion to um you know and I, I love for example um Shella Bet, the fact that is an engineering student and but also as a writer and a performer and you know has many things she wants to do with her life but she became was a writer and an actress on on this project and I know we're going to do other things yeah. as well that that's phenomenal and that's I think because of Act Now's great work with with people and artists like her so I'm just lucky I got on the on the bus with you people is, is uh, mm. you know, and, and that mixing oh, sorry Alex you go oh, sorry I was, I was just going to say you know how um that has been such a strength of that of the collaboration um, yeah, having 
been um, scaffolding with with ACT Now, um, with the Pathway Program, and then also kind of my personal writing projects. It's just, yeah, just having that uh, that, that network, absolutely. So I just want to um, echo everything that you've been saying. But um, I, I feel like if, when we do, when we do Decameron 3.0, just uh, because we'll have more time and, and thought about, you know, the, critically what we could have done better. And I feel um, that when we do Decameron 3.0, um, just really kind of getting in early with the accessibility and just, you know, how we could have, yeah, find found more funding to actually, you know, have the, um, the what do you call it, that audio thing and and um, and Auslan and just, you know, just thinking more around that, um, just as my reflections on how I, I needed to raise that earlier and just kind of have those conversations. And, um, you know, that's a privilege of being able-bodied, you know, so. Um, I think that in that conversation that we just had a lot of, uh, we, we touched upon the um, the integration of emerging artists with established artists, which I think was another uh, thing that you don't see much of and was really, really lovely. And I wondered whether you could, I mean, I think it's something that it's, it's not always easy to do that, but I think I would wonder whether you agree that we'd be lovely to have more of that because it was amazing to see someone like Teddy Hodgman as one of the actors and then also actors who who'd met, we'd never seen on the screen before or potentially even on the stage before. Um, and they each bring something really beautiful to it. So I just wondered if everyone could talk or some, whoever wants to could, could have anything to say about that. Oh, can I go really quickly? Um, me, me, me. Um, I was really, um, tough to um yeah kind of be able to be a part of the conversations in the casting at, uh, about thinking not only who, who i'm going to write for um in my kind of character and who i could see delivering it but thinking about um, offering platforms for people that aren't actors like jack buckskin it was so deadly just to um have a piece that you know i felt like he did he's not even an actor he was so deadly just kind, kind of having um yeah, him to have an opportunity to just kind of, um, you know, stretch his wings a bit more um, in, a, in a different direction, but, you know, he's a performer and yeah. Um, and just, from, I mentioned this earlier, but some of the um, pathway participants that have um, come through previously and um, the piece that you directed, Mitchell, with um, Kira, yeah, 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 so. That was fun. Uh -huh. I I would read Teddy, that was interesting you say, like there was a day when, so I got to direct Teddy's um, monologues, which is so great. But after he'd finished, the, the gang had gone to, what's that Greek restaurant, the Greek supermarket you went to, Edwin? Oh yeah, um, I forget the name. Oh, uh, the it's one, Bob, near, Bob near Bob and, yeah. It's yeah. a big market. Anyway, they brought these Dalmatis and like, you know, dips and la 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 la. And so we, we stopped to have lunch or an afternoon tea. So it's, you know, myself and Kat. So, Caitlin and Grace, I think, had just done their, you know, their queer monologue. Alexis had been directing Josh um, Camden, Camden that day. Yeah. Teddy was there. Even Upsy was there. Anthony was there. And you could, I just, Teddy would have been so great. Teddy's like, I think, you know, in his late 80s. And was everyone was eating this food. And I was like, what a great moment. Like, people, all these different, you know, an African actress, a, a, a Down syndrome actor, queer actors. Teddy, one of the, the greatest theatre actors in, in the country, all having Dalmatis out the front, all <laughs> creating work and all loving each. I mean, I look, I sound like a total hippie, but like <laughs> it, there was kind of a kind of uh, joy in the work, but a joy in new connections. And then Teddy came to the rap, we had a rap party thing. -o. And again, that was such a beautiful night. Just, um, and, and in fact, the photo from that is the photo, when I said, oh, what photo do you want to use in the 2021 brochure? I'm like, that one from the decamera map party because it was, <laughs> so it was a, a very and i think it was the last one of the last days i think edwin of the film so um that as you say the kind of the joining of established and emerging artists was really key. but and i think twas ever thus in the theater if it's being done properly as well like you know my acting school was learning from all the performers and all the artists and different kinds of artists and from different communities. And that's as it should be for uh, a new generation of artists as well, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I've actually written out a list of some of the deadly um, actors that I got to work with. Um, so there was Louis Collins, who did uh, their their own monologue, which was deadly, and um, Maggie Eilert, 
uh, and I got to direct um, their wonderful monologue as well. And then um, uh, I got to direct Elaine Crombie, who's incredible, Jack Buckskin, who I mentioned, um, Kira Wilson, which you got to do, Mitchell, um, Trevor Jamison as well, uh, a piece that I wrote and then a piece that uh, Kiara wrote. Uh, you, you got to direct Kyron, hey, um, yep. Kyron Wheatra as well. And um, and then I also directed um, Shabana Aziz, I think she's from AC Arts, Deadly, and um, Kidan Zelek, please, I'm so sorry if I've got your name wrong, but yeah, um, she was amazing as well. And uh, for a piece that I wrote and a piece that Kiara wrote, and Jermaine Hampton and Josh Campton for, and I directed him a piece that I wrote and a piece that um, he'd written as well. Um, yeah, and Jermaine did one of uh, Kyron Witcher's writings and, and mine. Uh, and no, and, um, and uh, Louise Wellington, who was an uh, emerging producer on Act Now, and big shout out to her. She was like, so deadly and amazing. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, and then she, she wrote this kick-ass monologue. So yeah, just shout out to them actors. <laughs> Thanks. And yeah, well, even just within that, that sort of is a perfect example because within that list of names, there are names that probably most people in Australia have heard of and others that it was the first time that, yeah, that they've ever acted. So that, that's beautiful. Um, so I guess sort of rounding, rounding up, um, you know, it, it's finished now, but it's still online for people to see, which is wonderful. And I actually, just before I came tonight, I, I had a look and at how many views they'd been. And it works out that the average view per episode, I've been doing some brain training, so I remembered how to uh, work that out, was 1,134 per episode, which I think is pretty good. Um, yes. Not, you know, not as good as a um, skateboarding cat or a fishing hamster or something maybe, but still pretty good. Um, so I just wondered what the future is for this project or whether there's a future for projects like this beyond COVID and what your thoughts are on that. Um, well, it, it, um, Edward and, and I've spoken about this. Oops, and we lost you. Back to Alexis as well. And, and to, um, as I think all, everyone on Zoom knows that Australian Plays has offered to um, publish it. So there'll probably be, uh, uh, for a small fee, schools and drama schools and anyone, who, that will, it will be downloadable from their web website, which is great. As Alexis says, suddenly all these monologues for First Nations students or kind of African students or, you know, queer, young queer actors or artists wanting, so people will be able to access, hopefully they have other lives beyond us. But we've also spoken about, is there another iteration or mutation of this that's kind of a, a kind of a, a combination of live, pre-recorded, immersive, um, so that it's not just, oh, now we do them all live in front of the campfire, but maybe there's a way of doing it that uh, uses you know a lot of media in the kind of re in the in the next kind of iteration of it. So that's uh, something we've been talking about, and is something hopefully we'll we'll venture towards. One of the things that's come from you know the having to isolate and all sorts of things and not being able to go to the theatre in person is that this stuff's being put online, and I think for a number of people who are outside the cities or who are um, for whatever reason, maybe with disability, may not be able to get to a theatre. Um, this kind of, uh, these sorts of openings and maybe there are other ways, additional ways that we can show theatre that more people can then see. I think it's a really interesting extension of the art form and whether it's something we can continue in, in whatever we make um, could be quite exciting. I know I've already used, I mentioned this to Alexis, um, I was teaching a playwriting course um, and one of the things that was really brilliant was being able to um, show the students one of the monologues that Alexis had written um, because we were talking about uh, pieces that were inspired by real world events and be being able to show them that as a piece of theatre that they could watch now on their computers. Um, and then have a great discussion about what was going on for that character. Um, it was just brilliant. So I think it's, it's this is already having a, a longer life and having more um, applications, if you like, which is I think, lovely. I think the interesting thing on that is the way that there's so much 
content in the world, so much data that it's it's not just about producing more stuff for online, but it's about what are the meaningful connections that this content can create in the real world. Like it kind of, it's always about how it can be placed back into the real world. And so Emily, I think your example is fantastic of like, it's the conversations that come from everyone having that shared experience of watching it, even if they watch it on, by themselves. Um, I know Alexis is working on arranging a, um, a screening of all the First Nations work in NAIDOC week next week. Um, and we're doing a, a, um, a screening of all the queer works in Feast Festival. So it's, it's interesting to kind of think of like, it's not, yeah, it's, it, I think people, a lot of people in Adelaide, for example, enjoyed it because they could watch it and then gossip to their friends about what they had seen. It's, it's that kind of thing, the foyer, the, the digital equivalent of the foyer conversations that make it kind of meaningful and worthwhile. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I think that probably wraps up. Somebody had asked us where, where they could see, and in the chat page here, where they could see the um, the episodes if they hadn't seen them yet. So it's the State Theatre Company uh, Decameron 2.0 uh, YouTube, and it's on YouTube, isn't it? Yes. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Mitchell, Edwin. Alexis and Emily, thank you so much on behalf of the Writers Guild and on from from everybody who's watched for for chatting with us tonight. And um, I would also like to say thank you to the Mercury Cinema who have uh, hosted me this evening because my computer died. And and obviously thank you to Art South Australia for their support of the project um, for happening at all. So um, does anyone have anything they want to say before we say goodbye? Um, thanks, Sally, uh, for being such a wonderful host and yeah, and a, and a writer in the writers' room. Um, and also, thank you so much to all the other participants for yeah, zooming in. And, I think, and also, just lastly, to the to the wider staff of Act Now and Safety Theatre Company as well, because everybody kind of really, you know, it wasn't just the artists, all the staffs, but went to, to make this thing happen. So, thanks to thanks to all of them also. And thanks to, I think, all the participants, all the writers and all the actors who haven't been mentioned tonight because there's too many for us to list, but... There's more than a hundred, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just how much everybody contributed and how much we all appreciate them all. Absolutely, yep. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Sally. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.